Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder. In this topic, we're going to introduce the concept of principal component analysis. So in this topic, we will introduce the idea of finding correlations between data. We will discuss how we can have factors and responses we are measuring through numerous trials. We will describe how our goal is to find orthogonal vectors that best describe the variation in the data in a manner similar to that which we used when finding least squares best fitting linear or quadratic polynomials. We will claim that these can be found simply by finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a particular positive semi-definite matrix which is actually quite easy to create given the data at hand. And we will therefore look at an example where we use this. All right, suppose you are reading two separate remote sensors. You plot one reading versus the other. Now, in this example, it appears as if there is some sort of relationship between the two readings. So if there isn't a relationship, can we somehow describe it? So first of all, we note that these readings do have a mean or an average. And again, that can just be calculated by summing all of the points as vectors and then dividing by the number of points. That would give us the point shown with the cross indicating the average of these values. Now, more importantly, can we describe a relationship between these readings? So for example, is there a line passing through the average point such that the distance to that line is minimized? Now, you may recall previously, we did this with the least squares best fitting curves. However, in that case, there was an independent variable or possibly more than one independent variable and then a dependent variable. And we attempted to find a function that best fit that data. In this case, we simply have two separate readings and we'd like to determine is there a relationship between those readings? In addition, could we describe this data by some form of lips? Could we find, for example, a second orthogonal vector that describes the distribution in the next dimension, which then allows us to describe this data via some sort of ellipse? Now suppose instead we had this data here. So for example, suppose the sensors from which we got this data were sufficiently remote that there was no real effect of a reading on one sensor versus a reading of the other sensor. Say for example, taking the temperature here, whereas another temperature reading is being taken in the Sahara there simply doesn't appear to be a strong correlation between these readings. So nevertheless, we could still potentially find the average or the mean of this data, and we could still try to find a line that best describes the relationship between these. However, if we found a second orthogonal vector that describe the relationship between this data, we'd almost certainly get an ellipse that is very close to a sphere, indicating that there likely is not really a strong correlation between a reading at one sensor with a reading at another sensor. And by strong correlation, I mean, for example, if you had two thermometers and they were a kilometer apart, they're not going to give exactly the same temperature but they're going to definitely give very similar temperatures. They may only be off by a degree or two, or maybe even three, but that would be it. Now, suppose that we have the following setup. We have a number of sensors, specifically N. 
The first column of this matrix will be the first sensor reading, the second column the second sensor reading, and finally the nth column will be the last sensor's reading. And then we will take a number of readings, perhaps periodically, once a day, once an hour. The first row represents the first reading. Just like with least squares, the first row represented the first x value, first raised to the power 0, then raised to the power 1, then perhaps squared. The second row is the second reading, and so on and so forth, until we have m readings. And we should have more readings than we have sensors. So, for example, suppose you are developing a polymer blend. See this paper, Methodology for Optimization of Polymer Blend Composition by Alexandra Martens Coelho et al. You have created M samples, and with each sample you have measured N different characteristics. Some of those characteristics may have been measured during the combination. These are called factors. So this could include the proportion of the polymers and other compounds, the amount of solvent, the time taken, the temperature. Other may be properties of the resulting product or responses. So the modulus of the elasticity, the tensile strength at breaking point, and the elongation at rupture. Question, are there relationships between the factors and the responses? And if so, can you use these to create the, a more optimal polymer blend? Now, the analysis of factors and responses and the relationships between them have been developing for centuries. In the late 1800s, William Gossett, writing under, under the pseudonym student, derived what is now known as student's T distribution, a method of analyzing variation within factors and responses when there are very few samples. Specifically, he happened to be the head brewer and more importantly, they had experimental brewer at Guinness. Again, you're making a very small number of batches and there are many different factors and responses that were being measured. The algorithm that we are looking at, however, is described as principal component analysis. And this was derived in 1901 by Carl Pearson. Again, someone else who has contributed significantly to the field of statistics. So our goal is given m data items, each with n variables or readings, be they factors or responses, and what we will do is as follows. We will first subtract off the mean or average of this collection of vectors. What this does is it centers the data around the origin. We will then look for subspaces that are optimal for describing the relationships between this data. So to do this, we will find one vector that defines a line or subspace that minimizes the distance of all factors and responses to that line. Now, this is called the first principal component. Let's say that this is of some vector w1. Next, having done so, we'd like to find the perpendicular component of each vector or data item to this first principal component. And so essentially, we will replace each x sub k with that data item minus the projection onto the first principal component. Having removed this, we repeat the process to find the next principal component. Again, this vector must now be perpendicular to w1, the first principal component. We can repeat this n different times 
and this is actually going to give us an orthogonal basis representing the data. Now this process sounds difficult, but actually there's a very straightforward way to find this. So let us assume that we have m separate experiments or n m different sets of readings, each of these storing n measurements of factors or responses, and we find the average of these vectors. So we add the m vectors together and divide by m. This will denote by x bar. Now, again, vectors are column vectors, so we will subtract this average or mean from each of the reading vectors x1 through xm, and we will create the m by n matrix by subtracting the vector off uh, subtracting the mean off of each vector and taking the transpose. So now this defines a matrix where the average of the rows is the zero vector. Now the covariant matrix is that n by n matrix defined as 1 over m times x transpose times x. And again, this should look vaguely familiar if you recall our calculations or the normal equations that we used to find the least squares, best fitting linear or quadratic polynomials. Specifically, the ijth entry determines how much there variation there is from the mean of the ith entry of the data versus the jth entry of the data between all the various readings. And this is then averaged. From our matrices, it's just one over M times the product of these entries within the matrix. Now, eigenvectors do not change under scalar multiplication. The eigenvectors of a matrix A equal the eigenvectors of that same matrix multiplied by any non-zero scalar. So we're going to continue simply dealing with the matrix C defined as X transpose times X. Now the matrix C defined as X transpose times X, which is proportional to the covariance matrix, is positive semi-definite. It is symmetric and all the eigenvalues must be greater than or equal to zero. And if the data is random, it's almost certain to be greater than zero. Consequently, there must be an eigenvalue decomposition where the matrix U is an orthogonal matrix comprised of eigenvectors, and these are normalized, and D is a diagonal matrix containing the eigenvalues on that diagonal. Now this is the matrix C as defined above. Now, if necessary, let's just reorder the eigenvalues from largest to smallest, swapping the entries on the diagonal and the columns of U as necessary. Now the unit eigenvectors define the principal components of this data. Additionally, if you wanted, you could also calculate the matrix U times the square root of 1 over M times the diagonal matrix. That is, the diagonal entries divided by M square rooted, these describe the variation of the principal components. Specifically, the square root of 1 over M times the kth eigenvalue all times the kth unit eigenvector describes the variation in the kth principal component and these together define an ellipsoid that contains a significant component of the data. Now that we have found the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix we can examine how quickly the values of the eigenvalues drop. 
For example, if all the eigenvalues are approximately the same in magnitude, then there is very little correlation between the factors and or responses. However, if there is a dominant eigenvalue or a few dominant eigenvalues with the other eigenvalues being relatively small, then it's actually possible to use these to control the responses by appropriately adjusting the factors. Suppose we collect the following data, where we are having 10 different preparations of a blended polymer. Suppose that the first column represents the proportion of solvent for each of the runs. The second gives the temperature in degrees Celsius. And the final is the elastic modulus of the result. Now, the mean of the proportions, temperatures, and elastic moduli are shown here in this vector x bar, and we can subtract that from each of the entries of the data. All right, so having done so, we now have the matrix X. First, we find the eigenvalue eigenvector pairs of the matrix, and we see that there is indeed one dominant eigenvalue and its corresponding eigenvector. The other two are reasonably small, indicating that they have less influence on the result. So we're going to focus on that dominant eigenvector with its eigenvalue. If you look at the right, there we see the original data and these three eigenvectors as multiplied by the square root of the eigenvalue over m. With that dominant eigenvector, we can add to the mean all possible scalar multiples of that dominant or principal component. So now we have the mean plus alpha times that principal component. Now, suppose that our target elastic modulus is some value E. So in this case, E would be the last entry 31.3 plus alpha times 0.901. Consequently, if we have a target E, we can find the appropriate alpha by solving for alpha. So alpha is assigned the target elastic modulus minus 31.3, all divided by 0.901. Given that alpha, we can then use this alpha to select the most appropriate proportions of solvent and temperature. So in that case, that would just be the first two entries of the matrix, 0 0.509 plus 0 0.011 alpha, and the temperature would be negative 9.37 degrees Celsius minus 0 0.432 degrees times alpha. So consequently, simply using this first principal component, we determine that if we wanted a target elastic modulus of 20, we would therefore find that alpha is negative 12.542. And from this, we determine that the proportion of solvent should be 0 0.371 and the temperature should be about minus four degrees Celsius. Similarly, if our target elastic modulus is 40, we determine that alpha is equal to 9.655, and therefore the most appropriate proportion of solvent is 0 0.615, and the appropriate temperature is negative 13.5 degrees Celsius. Following this topic, you now understand the idea behind principal component analysis. You know that 
having subtracted off the average or mean of the data, we can define a matrix X that can be used to find a scalar multiple of the covariance matrix. And you are aware that the eigenvalues and eigenvectors can be used to determine if there are any strong correlations between the factors and responses. If there is, you can use this to greatly simplify problems you are trying to control. And we did so in one particular example. Here are the references, acknowledgements, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers.